Yeah, let's start with the, uh, with the video, please. The book of Ecclesiastes, it's part of the Bible's wisdom literature, and it opens with this line, the words of Kohelet, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now in Hebrew, the word Kohelet means someone who has gathered people together. And in this case, it's to learn, so it's often translated in English as teacher. And the teacher is said to be a son or a descendant of King David. And so there are different views about who this figure might have been. Many think that it refers to King Solomon, others to maybe one of the later kings of David's line, and still others think that it's actually a later Israelite teacher who has adopted a Solomon-like persona as a teaching aid. Whichever of these views is correct, the key thing is to recognize that the teacher is a character in the book and is different than the author of the book, who remains anonymous. So we do hear the teacher's voice for most of the book, but it's actually a different voice, the author, who introduces us to the teacher in the first sentence and then at the end concludes the book by summarizing and evaluating everything the teacher just said. So the author is someone who wants us to hear all that the teacher has to say and then help us process it and form our own conclusion. So what does the teacher have to say? Well, the author summarizes the teacher's basic message at the beginning and right at the end, and it's hevel, hevel. Everything is utterly hevel. Now, most English Bibles translate this word hevel as meaningless, but that doesn't quite capture the heart of the idea. In Hebrew, hevel literally means vapor or smoke, and the teacher uses this word 38 times in the book as a metaphor to describe how life is, first of all, temporary or fleeting, like a wisp of smoke. But secondly, also how life is an enigma or a paradox. Like smoke, it appears solid, but when you try and grab onto it, there's nothing there. So there's so much beauty or goodness in the world, but just when you're enjoying it, tragedy strikes and it all seems to blow away. Or we all have a strong sense of justice, but all the time bad things happen to good people. So life is constantly, it's unpredictable, it's unstable, or in the teacher's words, like chasing after the wind. Hevel. Now that's kind of a downer. So why is he saying all of this? The author's basic goal is to target all of the ways that we try to build meaning and purpose in our lives apart from God. And he lets the teacher deconstruct these. So the author thinks we spend most of our time investing energy and emotion in things that ultimately have no lasting meaning or significance. And he lets the teacher give us a hard lesson in reality. You can see this most clearly in the opening and closing poems, which focus first of all on time and then on death. So the teacher says, you can spend your whole life working and achieving because you think that makes your life meaningful. You should really stop and consider the march of time. For all of the human effort that takes place in the world, nothing really ever changes. So sure, we develop technology and we build nations that rise and fall, but go climb a mountain and see if it cares. It was there long before any of us and it will be here long after. I mean, no one's even going to remember you or anything you did a hundred years from now, but that mountain, it'll still be there. And the ocean will still be breaking on the beach and the sun will still rise and set. And so time will eventually erase you and me and everything that we care about. And if that's not disheartening enough, the teacher also can't stop talking about death all the way through the book, but especially in this poem near the end. He says, death is the great equalizer and it renders meaningless most of our daily activities. It devours the wise and the fool, the rich and the poor, no matter who you are, what you've done, good or bad, we're all gonna die and it's inescapable. So with these two ideas in hand, the teacher goes on to consider all the activities and false hopes that we invest our lives in to find meaning and significance, like wealth or career or social status or pleasure. So you think working hard is going to make life worth it? Think about the stress and the toll that that takes on you, all the anxiety and the sleepless nights. And by the time you actually earn some wealth, you're going to be too old to enjoy it anyway. And then by the time that you have to pass it on to someone, they may not even be someone who cares about anything that you did. Or maybe you think pleasure is going to make life worth it for you. Go for it. You know, live for your vacations. Live for the weekend party. Monday always comes. Hevel, hevel. 
everything is utterly hevel. So what does the teacher advocate then? That we become pure hedonists or relativists? Well, no, that would be Hevel too. The teacher acknowledges the ideas from Proverbs that living by wisdom and the fear of the Lord, that these have real advantages. On the whole, life will probably go better for you. See, but the problem is that even living by wisdom and the fear of the Lord, they're Hevel too, because they don't guarantee a good life. Good people die tragically, and horrible people live long and prosper. There's just too many exceptions, and so even wisdom is a hevel. Again, not meaningless, but an enigma. Wisdom doesn't work the way you think it should all of the time. So what's the way forward in the midst of all this hevel? And here, paradoxically, the teacher discovers the key to the true enjoyment of life under the sun. It's accepting hevel. It's acknowledging that everything in your life is totally out of your control. About six different times at some of the bleakest moments in his monologue, the teacher talks about the gift of God, which is the enjoyment of simple, good things in life, like friendship or family, a good meal or a sunny day. You can't control these things. You're certainly not guaranteed them, but that's their beauty. When I come to adopt a posture of total trust in God, it frees me to simply enjoy my life as I actually experience it, not as I think it ought to be, because even my expectations about what life ought to be are ultimately hevel, hevel. Everything under the sun is utterly hevel. And so the teacher's words come to a close. Right here at the end, the author speaks up again, and he brings it all to a conclusion. He says, the teacher's words are very important for us to hear. He likens them to a shepherd's staff with a goad, a pointy end, which might hurt when it pokes you. But he says the teacher is trying to poke you to get you to move in the right direction towards greater wisdom. The author then warns us that you can actually take the teacher's words too far, and you could spend your whole life buried in books trying to answer life's existential puzzles. Don't try, he says. You'll never get there. And so instead, the author offers his own conclusion, and it's this. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of humans, for God will bring every deed into judgment, every hidden thing, whether good or evil. And so the author thinks it's good to let the teacher challenge your false hopes and remind you that time and death make most of life completely out of your control. But what gives life true meaning is the hope of God's judgment, the hope that one day God will clear away all of the hevel and bring true justice to our world. And it's that hope that should fuel a life of honesty and integrity before God, despite the fact that I remain puzzled by most of life's mysteries. And that's the wisdom of the book of Ecclesiastes. I think this may be going out for some reason. Let's switch to this one, Johnny, if we can. We'll just go with this, with this mic right here tonight. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Um, let's stand together. We're going to read a couple of verses here, that are, and you're going to see them again. In fact, for more than a couple of times as we're looking through, trying to learn, get a grasp on the book of Ecclesiastes. Looking at it, I, I take issue with the author, by the way, of the, of the video, that uh, I think the author and the teacher are the same person, but that's, he's, he's staked himself in one of the, one of the positions that uh, people who study this do, and I grant that. I think it's the same person. As we look at the vanity of a life without God, you could say a vanity of vanity of chasing after the wind rather than seeking after God. Ecclesiastes 2:24 is one verse, and then Ecclesiastes 12:13, 12, 12, 13, and 14. There's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. And then Ecclesiastes 12, toward the end. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. We've just read together what? It's the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. We want it to shape our minds. We just came through Proverbs last week. We, we lack wisdom. We're asking of God to give us generous portions 
of his wisdom from his word. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, while it emphasizes vanity, has a lot of wisdom, a lot of good things to say about how we live life to the glory of God and bring meaning to an otherwise meaningless existence. Thank you. Please be seated. This, this book records what someone called an intense search by the preacher or the teacher, that's the word, the meaning of the word that, that Oloeth, uh, for meaning and satisfaction in life. Even though a casual observer will recognize that there are inequities, there are inconsistencies. You know people that are, are just rotten to the core and they seem to flourish, they seem to thrive. You know people that you would say are good people, moral people, upright people, and they seem to face tragedy uh, and trial uh, and, and incredible burdens. But in between all of that, move, there, is, there is meaning, of, and there was, as he was talking about that on the video, when you come to face life honestly, to face life's challenges honestly, the doctrine that gets you through this is the doctrine of God's absolute sovereignty over all of life. If life can get out of control under the watch care of a God who is not in control, then we have trouble. <laughs> we've, we've, got, we've got more heaven than you can imagine, all right? But we know that that's the doctrine that keeps us, keeps us going. Um, the key word, and we'll see this again later, is vanity. Uh, it's uh, the word hevel. It means smoke or vapor. Uh, it is the, the futile emptiness of trying to make sense out of life apart from God. And it's looking at life, this, I said this term 29 times, under the sun comes up. It's uh, looking at life as it's lived in the universe and specifically for us on planet Earth. Life's pursuits can lead uh, only to frustration apart from God. Power, prestige, pleasure, none of that can fill what, what Augustine, the, one of the early church fathers, called this, this God-shaped void in our hearts. You've made us for yourself, he said. And our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you. Only God can fill that. If you're familiar with, with uh, Pilgrim's Progress, I know that Matt's reading through that now. Um, the slew of despond, when, when, uh, when Christian leaves the city of destruction it hits that slew of despond and it's bottomless. You, no matter how, much, how many bricks and stuff you put in it to try to hit a bottom, it will not, it will not take it. You have to walk uh, through it on the, on the stones of faith. Otherwise, you sink. If you look from God's perspective at life, it becomes meaningful. A skepticism and despair melt away when each day is viewed as, one well, of the key words, gift, as a gift from God. Every now and then I like to get young people when I'm teaching them in, in some setting to get them to stop. I want you to do an exercise with me. I want you to inhale, exhale, do that several times. Stop and remember that according to the scripture, uh, you do that by God's permission. It's his kindness that lets you draw a breath it's his kindness that lets you expel a meaningful breath. So I want to just real quickly do a sketch of the, uh, of the outline of this, and then we'll kind of look at it a little more in depth in a, in a, in a uh, survey of it. The scene, as I said, uh, of this is the, the universe. It's under the sun. Everything happens under the sun. We've, we looked at some different books, and, and one was, this was in Egypt, and, and this was uh, in Jerusalem. And, well, this is, this is a little bigger picture. <laughs> A little bigger stage that we've been accustomed to under the sun. The date that you would put on this is about approximately 935 A.D. toward the end of Solomon's life. I do think Solomon is the author. I think he's the author and the teacher uh, for the use of the pronoun I that comes up in here. The thesis of it is all is vanity. Uh, and there's, so there's this initial as the book opens. There's a declaration of vanity. Then when you break that first section down, that chapter 1 verse 1 through chapter 1, verse 11, that there's the introduction of vanity. There's the illustration of vanity as he just draws from life. There's the second major movement in the, in the book is, is this, this proof. If the assertion is life is vanity, 
then there's proof that's marshaled for it. And the proof comes, first of all, from Scripture uh, in chapter 1, verse 12, to chapter 2, verse 26. Then proof from observation, uh, chapter 3, 1 through 6, 12. And then the last section, uh, there's counsel given about how do, you, how do you meet this? How do you, how do you live in the midst of a very vain society. It's not, this is timely stuff, I think. We're seeing people chasing after so many things that have no value, aligning themselves with movements and, and that's, that, are, that are destined to end in tragedy. And so how do you, deliver, how do you get delivered from vanity? Uh, how do you cope with a wicked world? Uh, you take counsel from the scripture, from the truth. And here it is. Here's the bottom line. We'll get to it when we finish. Fear God. Obey God. Fear God. Keep his commandments. Now we've talked enough about that through the years here that, that you understand, first of all, we've, we've managed, I believe, by God's grace to stay out of two ditches. Theologically. One ditch is a legalistic ditch that takes the commandments of God and, and as a taskmaster, a pharisaical approach, puts them as a burden on the people, is what the Pharisees did. The other ditch is, to, is just to cast them off, to abandon them uh, so that licentiousness, that it doesn't really matter uh, what you do and how you live. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, Lord willing, next Sunday morning. And I said to you this morning, Paul gives this catalog of just of, of scandalous lifestyles. And he says, but such were some of you. There's, there's a change that comes. And so what we've managed to do, I believe, uh, in, with studying the scripture as it's laid out before us, is we walk that evangelical path, that gospel path, where we recognize that, that the commandments of God, 1 John 5, they're not a burden. And the commandments, we're talking about the Ten Commandments. God's law summarized, his moral law summarized in the Ten Commandments. They're not a burden to the people of God. We've been enabled by the Spirit to love him. And in, and in a gospel way, because Jesus Christ perfectly kept the law of God, we're able to love God and, and to strive to obey his commandments, knowing we have a helper uh, when we stumble, when we fall, who will pick us up and move us forward. And so that's the conclusion. Um, this book is one of them that had a hard time getting into the canon of Scripture. In other words, I had a hard time finding itself uh, in this compilation of 66 books we call the Holy Bible. Um, it was at the Council of Jamnia in 90 AD that, that finally the, the weight on the scales that while there were passages that gave pause, that God as Elohim is mentioned throughout the book, and that it teaches us some, some things very honestly that, that comport with the rest of Scripture about the character of God and about the character of man and the need of man. So, so it, it made its way uh, into that. Ecclesiastes, look at Ecclesiastes 1.18 uh, with me real quickly. This theme that all is vanity, all is vanity, it picks up in the early parts of the book and carries through uh, under the proof section, of, even in chapter 6. Chapter 1, verse 18, for in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Here's one of the things that the teacher discovered that simply learning and even learning wisdom we talked about that last week what, what real wisdom is learning wisdom as an end in itself uh, simply adds sorrow in, in this case you want to be careful here in this case hearing what the, what the teacher says you could almost say that in this case there is a certain blissfulness to ignorance. To whom much is given, much is required. The more we know, the more we are accountable for. And so we have to be careful that when we pursue knowledge and desire it to be wisdom, that we recognize that, that the real lasting wisdom is connected to knowing God. J.I. Packer's great work. If you've not read J.I. Packer's work, Knowing God, I think it came through its 20th or 25th Anniversary publication a few years ago. J.I. Packer is one of the premier scholars of our day. Uh, but it's an excellent book. I commend it to you wholeheartedly. Knowing God. Having addressed wisdom in the early part of the, of the book, then he begins to move, the teacher does in chapter 2, 
uh, to the idea of laughter and hedonism or, or pleasure and wine, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, then, then turns to works and women and wealth, uh, chapter 2, verses 4 to 11. But again, the pursuit of all of these things, if you, if you think you've laid hold of them, for any reason other than, than knowing God, then it's emptiness. It's frustration. It's the, it's the proverbial child on Christmas morning who opens the gift and you find the child playing with the wrapping of the gift more than the gift itself and then not long after that you see both wrapping and gift have been set aside and discarded. It's the anticipation of it was greater than the reality of achieving. And so we've, we've discovered that contentment and joy are found only in God. <clears throat> and it's at this point in the movement of the book that uh, when you get into chapter 3, the, the author begins to, to talk about a, something of a philosophical pursuit. Uh, he looks, let's just look at this real quickly, read a little bit to you. Chapter 3, you know this passage. Uh, if you grew up in the era that I grew up in, a group called the Birds, uh, made a song out of this. To everything, there is a season, right? A time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant. This is chapter 3. A time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. The fixed reality of life that God sets before us. Then he says, what gain has the worker from his toil? I've seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He's made everything beautiful in its time. Notice, notice he's bouncing from, from the vanity of toil to the meaningfulness when it's attached to God. Also, he has put eternity in man's heart. That's a pretty, that's a pretty powerful statement. It's, I don't know how many of you uh, went through the perspectives training when we had that here several years ago, and there was a, a book by, uh, entitled Brusco, and, and one of the missionaries wrote it. But he latches on to this, that the hardest heart you've ever known, the darkest mind you've ever encountered, that person, a creature made in the image of God, has eternity in his or her heart. The agitating, frustrating reality that there's something more. And God has done this. He has put eternity in the heart of every man. But he's done this, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Paul says it in Romans this way, in Romans chapter 1, that there is enough of God revealed in nature to hold every man, woman, and child guilty before him. There is not enough of God revealed in nature for anyone to be saved by that way. That, the whole idea is that, that the natural revelation of God troubles us, our conscience. It, it stirs us. It provokes us to ask, is there more? What else, what else is there? What else is it? To begin the pursuit of seeking outside of ourselves how to have a relationship with this creator. And the, uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes addresses that. Time is short. On earth we do not experience eternity, though we carry it, the reality of it in our hearts, all of our lives. And death comes to all, the righteous and the wicked. What the bumper sticker you see, whoever dies with the most toys still dies. 
Then chapters four and five begin to explore the, the, the futility of social relationships, uh, whether, whether you're under oppression, experience rivalry, covetousness, the discontentment with life, power, and as well as religious relationships, uh, formalism. You go back and read the Old Testament and, and the New Testament. You know, God says in the Old Testament to, to his religious leaders, I hate your worship. These people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And in the New Testament, Jesus chides the Pharisees for their empty praying, their meaningless vows. And religion, just for the sake of religion, produces disappointment. And by the way, you know a lot of people like this. You know a lot of people that you couldn't get to come inside a church building with a gun to their heads because they had a, had a less than satisfying experience with religion. And so we've got to break through that. We've got to remember that ultimate satisfaction is found only in God. And then, the, then the last section of this, of this book, the counsel for living with vanity. Uh, there's these lessons that come forth. Uh, the, the teacher teaches us wisdom and self-control provide perspective and strength in how to cope with life. It's okay to enjoy prosperity as long as you don't cling to it. You read this section. If you're blessed with that, rejoice with open hands. Consider in adversity that God made both. When you experience what Job says the Lord gave, the Lord taken away. In this section, we come face to face with the counsel to avoid the twin extremes of self-righteousness. Remember the two ditches a while ago? Self-righteousness, a Phariseeism, a legalism, a, well, I'm doing okay over here, and immorality, the other ditch. It doesn't matter. I live like I want to. This is what we're dealing with in, in Corinth in the study on Sunday mornings. These folks really believe, and you're going to see it next week, that the grace of God come to them as sinners, allowed them to continue their sinful lifestyles. This section shows us that sin is, is a problem for all mankind and that wisdom can be cut short by a pursuit of evil that leads to death. The human mind on its own will never grasp ultimate meaning. We have to look beyond and look above. And so you, you live with this tension in this last section, what we call the uncertainties of life and the certainty of death, that death will come. That we, and that what that teaches is you can't always see God's purposes in life. It, uh, there's a poem that was written, I think it's an old hymn. Uh, when you cannot trace his hand, trust his heart. It's, it's not only or merely what you experience God doing in your life. It's, it's what you know of God, what you know about him, his character. And then, of course, the, the uncertainties of life and the certainty of death teach us to be good stewards of every opportunity. The night is coming, Jesus said, when no one can work. And in, this, in the last section, chapter, chapter 9, 13 through 11, 6, there's this wisdom is contrasted with meaningless talk and foolish efforts. Again, in Pilgrim's Progress, you encounter this fellow named Talkative. Talkative loves to talk about religion, but he, he likes to experience religion in, in the dainty slippers. <laughs> it's, in other words, he... He likes it when he can tiptoe through the tulip, so to speak. A religion, religious talk that talks about hardship and suffering and self-denial, he's not, he's not much for that. And so wisdom is set forth in this last section to pursue and seek wisdom so as to come to understand and know God. But it involves discipline and diligence. There's this uh, section where the, where the preacher 
gives these exhortations of, of using life well, chapter 11, verse 7, through chapter 12, verse 7. He exhorts young people, the youth, in their, in their youth, to remember their creator. And then he does something, I want to read this, look at chapter 12, verses 1 to 7. The section closes with an amazing description of old age. This is, this is nearer and dearer to me all the time. Remember also the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed and the doors on the streets are shut when the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern and the dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit returns to God who gave you. You just you read that and you hear, you hear the grinding down of life. I've been visiting with one of our folks in the hospital who's gotten pretty, pretty far beyond three score and 10. Three score and 10 is 70. When you're hitting 90, you're pretty much beyond three score and 10. We just had some great talks about frailty and uh, desire for strength, yet recognizing that, won't, that strength won't be recovered to any large measure. And it's just been a real sobering uh, discussions but sweet discussions because, see, this particular one knows God. Knows that ultimately his times are in God's hands. But see, I've also had the conversations in the past with people up in age who don't know God. And it is tragic to watch the, the floundering, the coming to terms with uh, what John Piper would call a wasted life. This book concludes with the exhortation that the, the good life is only attained by revering God. You could take a prominent uh, alcohol commercial from years ago, you only go around once in life, you better grab hold of God on the way around. That's always gonna mean anything. You can grab the golden ring and miss everything. You can go for all the gusto and miss everything. You only go around once. Those who fail to take God and his will seriously into account are doomed to live lives of foolishness and futility. I read of the death a couple of days ago of a billionaire, a friend of some of our family. He left it all. He left it all. I don't know, I don't, didn't know the man personally, but I knew of him. I've just wondered and prayed, dear God, I pray that, that he knew you, that in all that he amassed in life, that underneath it all as the foundation was a personal relationship with you. Ecclesiastes 12, 11 says, the words of the wise are like goads. You saw that picture on the video. Like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. We're going to see this one shepherd image a little later. So when, that's a little survey. When you, when you think about this book uh, and its title, um, obviously vanity, the, the video speaks of, of hevel, of, of smoke and vapor chasing after the wind. I think both of those, they're not mutually exclusive. Vanity, the futile emptiness of trying to be happy apart from God. It's introduced that way, Ecclesiastes 1.1, 1, 1, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. By the way, when we get to the idea of author, only Solomon, think about this, only Solomon, he was the only son of David who as king ruled from Jerusalem. And I think that's a very compelling argument for his authorship of this. 
Then in verse 12, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. So see, I, I think this is where in my mind you wed the idea of the author and the one who is the teacher. Solomon, of course, the wisest, richest, most influential king in Israel's history. And toward the end of his life, he looks at life under the sun. At the end of his life, when some of the glory is fading, when the prestige is fading, when he has made some very seriously erroneous choices that are costing him, He sees that, pop, that power and popularity and prestige and pleasure, none of that can fill the God-shaped void, as we talked about a while ago. So Solomon, looking from God's perspective, says, Eat, drink, rejoice, do good. This is not your eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Eat, drink, rejoice, do good, live joyfully, fear God, keep his commandments. That's, this is what, what Solomon comes to see that that he's given us all things to enjoy, but not enjoy as an end in ourselves. Not to spend upon us as the, as the be all end all. The Hebrew title, which you saw in the video, Koalet, uh, is only found in this book. There's not another book in the Old Testament that uses this term. It's from a word that means to convoke an assembly, to assemble. To summon in order to be taught. One who addresses an assembly or a preacher. That's the Hebrew title, Koala. The Greek Old Testament title, we've looked at these, uh, is the actual Greek word ecclesiastes. It's derived from the Greek word ekklesia. You should recognize that. It means assembly, congregation, church. And in this form it means preacher. One of these unusual occurrences, the Greek term Ecclesiastes and the Latin term are the same, Ecclesiastes, means speaker before an assembly. And so you can see how the book gets its name uh, for people who are, who are not reading the Hebrew Old Testament. I've already told you I believe that this Solomon uh, is, the, is the author. There's external evidence that suggests that in the Jewish Talmud. Uh, in the internal evidence, which I'm more concerned with, we read for you chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 1, verse 12. Uh, qualified to be a descendant of David, ruling from Jerusalem. And so we believe that, uh, that he is the author. Somebody said this. Jewish tradition, I think, says, Solomon wrote the Song of Solomon, which we're going to look at next Sunday night, Lord willing. Solomon wrote the Song of Solomon in his youthful years, when he was a young man. I think before he picked up 900 wives through those suzerainty treaties. I'm glad he wrote it before all that. Proverbs, they said he wrote, in his middle years when he was at full stride. Ecclesiastes in his last years. Looking back, reflecting. You pick up sometimes a tone of regret for folly for carnality, for idolatry. Now, the book, the book of Ecclesiastes is a challenge for us because there are no historical events uh, recognized in it. But given the material available, we do think 935 B.C., 936 B.C. is a good time frame. The theme and purpose, we've already touched on that, uh, is... This, this diligent, earnest search that recognizes and wants to share in a powerful way the emptiness and futility of power, popularity, prestige, and pleasure apart from God. This word vanity, depending on, I didn't go through the Hebrew text and count, but the materials I've read say 37. I think the author of our video said 38 uh, times. To say again that you, <clears throat> you will not be able to make sense of life unless you see it through the lens of the creator who made you and called you into a relationship with himself. 
I caught a part of a movie recently. Batman versus Superman. I don't I don't watch a lot of the, those, those I, I don't know whether they're Marvel or DC, I forget which one. Anyway, but one of the bad guys in it was talking a lot about God. And he and he set up the the age old problem of evil. God is good, wouldn't be evil. God is powerful, it wouldn't be evil. He, he's, he's taking this is right out of one of the philosophy texts that's debated in seminaries. And if there's evil, then he's either not good or he's not powerful. I thought, wow, that's that's amazing for that to pop up in this movie. But but you see, it really is the perplexing issue. To press upon someone, is there a God? Know the wheels will start turning in their mind? And if there is, there's something missing in him. Because it's a mess here. But if you come at it from the vantage point of the, of the author of Ecclesiastes, give the given that life in a fallen earth is going to be filled with vanity, then you look to God for light from God to walk through life and you find, this is the beautiful thing, you find that the most difficult times in your life you can safely place in the hands of a good and loving God knowing that he is working all things together for good, for, for the overarching good of his plan and for your good, the good of your soul since we were not made for this. He's put eternity in our, in our hearts. We're made for a better place. And as you can, you can experience that when you, when you live life through the lenses of a world created by God, fallen on our way from the city of destruction, Pilgrim's Progress, to the celestial city. See, Ecclesiastes doesn't give the satisfying answers that the curious mind wants. Because you cannot encapsule the mind of God to satisfy the curious. If you could, if you could make sense of God, by definition, he would not be God. You would be. But it does set forth that man's search for what, what one writer called the sunum, uh, the sumum bonum, the, the highest good, the greatest good, has got to begin searching for God and end in finding God. And the satisfaction will only be found finally beyond this world. Look at the end of the book with me real quickly. Just again, we're going to keep seeing this come up. Ecclesiastes 12, thir uh, verses 13 and 14, the end of the matter, all has been heard. So we've, he's considered all these angles. Here's the sum of it. John does this in 1 John, by the way. This is love to God that we keep his commandments. The end of the matter, fear God. We talked about the fear of God in Proverbs, what that is. And keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your being. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. And you do this, you live life, not again under your own strength, because when the challenge, when you take seriously the challenge to, to keep God's commandments, if you're serious about them, you're not playing fast and loose, not toying around, not redefining the terms, you find yourself under a weight Christian's burden in Pilgrim's Progress that cannot be removed except by God's means, the gospel. Wisdom involves living a life from a divine perspective. And so Ecclesiastes 2, 24 to 26, listen to, listen to the writer here because this is, this is how I think you read this so that you don't get discouraged, don't get despairing. There's nothing better for a person than that he should, we cited this a while ago, should eat, drink, should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. This is God's way for you to live. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, 
God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner, he's given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity. Notice the contrast. To live that way from the hand of God, to give glory to God, but to live that way for yourself, to consume upon yourself. Vanity. Chasing after the wind. Trying to grab hevel. Look at some verses with us. Just to go through a few here to, to get your appetite wet. Look at Ecclesiastes 3, 12 and 13. I perceive that there's nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Keep going in chapter 3. Verse 22, so I, I saw that there's nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that, that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Again, chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him. A few days of his life by comparison to eternity. For this is his lot. Everyone else to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Here's the, here's the fellow who is living for God. He can take in all that God gives him. And it doesn't turn to, to moth-eaten material or rust-corrupted gain he lives it receiving it from the hand of God and in the end those are not his memories his mind is fixed upon God here's Ecclesiastes 8 15 the reason I'm reading these to you is because sometimes when you hear people talk about Ecclesiastes it's just it's just a real downer these this language here is not a downer if you understand that it's all traces to finding meaning in God purpose in God and I commend joy, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. Again, chapter 9, verses 7 to 10. Go, eat your bread with joy, drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white, let not oil be lacking on your head. This, this is a picture of a man who is blessed. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he's given you under the sun because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. He's not su suggesting here that, that, that living with your wife is vain. He's simply saying vain life that, that it's going to end. It's not going to last forever. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol in the abode of the dead to which you're going. And then 11, verses 8 and 9. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all, but let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. It's a warning. You want to go your way? You want to make pursuit of pleasure your goal? ease, whatever, fill, fill in the gap, doesn't matter, there's a thousand things that go in the gap there, in the blank space. But know this, for all of this, God will bring you to judgment. Then to, just real quickly touch on the keys, because I've already cited these for you. The key word, of course, is vanity, uh, the futile emptiness of trying to be happy apart from God, the key verses we read at the beginning of our time tonight and I've cited them each of them a couple of times the key chapter is chapter 12 where the book is being brought to a close uh, and it's and it's in as he comes to this uh, that he's looking back and giving the summary of the matter he says if you're looking at life through the through the spectacle of the natural man who, who sees life as an end in itself, then it's all vanity. But if you look at it from the perspective of God, then it has, 
has meaning. And he's honest about his own pursuits that came to nothing finally. Well, I want to move on and uh, look at Jesus. Finding Jesus. Where do we see Jesus? That's what this course is about. It's to take a look and do summaries of these books and see how do we learn more about Jesus Christ. Well, in Ecclesiastes, uh, as I've said, there's a, there's a, a convincing argument uh, for the emptiness of life without a relationship with Jesus Christ. Look at Ecclesiastes 3.11 again. He's made everything beautiful in his time. He has put eternity into man's heart. I don't think back. If, if you're converted here now, if you come to faith in Jesus Christ, think back to the time when your heart began to be troubled. Um, maybe before that, if you were like me, I'd been, I was very satisfied with my religiosity. I was excelling. I I outscored all my peers in, in, in how quick I could find a passage of the scripture. In Bible drill, I outscored all my peers in terms of how, how much scripture I memorized. I remember one vacation in Bible school, they gave us five little cards with scripture verses on each side, and I blew through all of those in the first couple of days. They had to start writing them out on other cards. I mean, no, one, no child came close to me in terms of how many, but that was me. It was just, it was just me. But over the years, I began to be troubled. I was troubled. I didn't know what to call it then, but it was eternity in my heart. And I had somehow managed to find a religious model and embrace it and live for myself in the name of living for God. But eternity was in my heart. And I remember finally just crying out, Lord, what do you want from me? What do you want? So it's there. If you know the Lord, you've, you've known some measure of that. Not, not exactly the same as another person, but you've known that troubling that you cannot rest until you rest in God's provision in Jesus Christ. And if, if you're not saved here tonight, then I pray that he will trouble your that, e that eternity part of you and stir you and that you will not rest until you come to confess Christ come to rest in him Jesus does that the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ does that people once dull and complacent begin to be irritated bothered. I've said for years, and this was not original with me, but I would rather have a person rail against me in terms of what I had stated about the truth of God and his word and the glory of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ than to simply ignore me because if they rail against me, they heard something. Something stirred them. I'd rather have that than them sleep through it. This picture of the one shepherd I mentioned a while ago. Look at Ecclesiastes 12, 11. The words of the wise are like goads. That's what I, that's what I began to experience, was the goad. What, what one writer calls the hounds of heaven. Nipping at your heels. Bunyan talks about that. Chasing you along toward God. The words of the wise are like goads and like nails, firmly fixed are the collected sayings. You, you can't bend them, you can't move them. They are given by one shepherd. That's an amazing statement that seems to pop out of almost nowhere in this book. They are given by one shepherd. Wisdom. Fixed truth. And you can, I can't read that without thinking about John chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Where Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. So, so Jesus presents himself as the shepherd of his sheep. This one shepherd. The troubling that comes to a person who seriously pursues life as it's laid out, the challenges laid out in the book of Ecclesiastes will, will bring him or her 
to the end of himself or herself to face the glorious need of a Savior provided by God to deliver us from our sins. Well, what's, what does this book do in its contribution to the Bible? There's, I've got several things here. I want to try to move through this because I want to get to the end of this and, and give you a picture uh, that was very helpful for me. Well, you could say this, it's the most philosophical book in the Bible. And it is loaded with human wisdom. This is why some people reject it. We'll, we'll talk about inspiration here in a few minutes. But it's just got too much, too much of man in it. But the reason it has too much of man is it is to show how empty and vain man's thoughts are apart from God. Just to touch on some things. Chapter 1, verse 13. I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It's an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. Verse 16. I said in my heart, I've acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom, to, to know madness and folly. And I perceive that this also is but a striving after the wind. For me to try to figure it out on my own. It's chasing the wind. There's more uh, human sayings than what we would be accustomed to. We're, we're moving after the Song of Solomon. You know, we're moving into the prophets, the major prophets and the minor prophets. And we're going to face over and over, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. Uh, the burden of the Lord comes to the prophet. Well, there's not a lot of thus saith the Lord in Ecclesiastes. Statements that, that contradict or seem to contradict the general teaching of Scripture occur here when they're taken out of context. For example, I'll just give you a couple of samples. Ecclesiastes 1.15, what is crooked cannot be made straight. Well, that was a very prophetic promise. The crooked shall be made straight. What is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. It's, it's, and again, the context is if, if it is begins in man and ends with man, that is true. And you've always got to remember that when you're reading this book. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 3, 19 and 20 is problematic. For when what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust they all return. He's not, he's not rejecting uh, immortality for, for creatures made in the image of God, nor is he asserting immortality for our pets. Uh, he is simply saying that from the vantage point of man, we're all going to go back to dust. Well, we won't spend a lot of, of time. I'm going to pass over some, some verses I have there. Let's talk about the inspiration of it real quickly. We're going to move to that uh, next section, Michelle. Some believe it's, it's uninspired, the book of Ecclesiastes, uninspired because uh, it seems to have a tone of fatalism in it. Uh, verse 15 of chapter 3, that which is already has been. That which is to be already uh, already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. In other words, you said it's all, it, it, there's a picture here that says it's all, it's all played out. It's all laid out. And it really has a fatalistic tone to it. But again, the context is, if, if, man, if it's a man-centered view of life, then this, this makes about as much sense as man-centered view of life. There's a pessimism that occurs. Ecclesiastes 4.2, I thought the dead who are already dead more fortunate than the living who are still alive. That's not a very, a very good, yeah, well, at least they're dead. That's not a very cheery, hopeful perspective on life. Sort of a hedonism. Nothing better, verse 24, chapter 2, nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. That's it. See, in the context, or out of context, it seems like just eat, drink, be merry, tomorrow we die. And then I already read uh, chapter 8, verse 15. There's a materialism that seems to pop up here. Uh, we talk, we've read portions of that already. They all go to one place. Verse 21, who knows whether the spirit of a man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down. It, there's, there's this questioning that man doesn't know. If, it's, if it begins and ends with man, there's a lot more questions 
than answers. Some, other, some people believe that the book's partially inspired uh, uh, as the best that the human mind can produce apart from God. Uh, of course, we, we would reject that. And then finally, uh, Ecclesiastes has difficult passages. We acknowledge that. But it is inspired of God. And we could, we, we've been showing you these, uh, these passages that demonstrate that. Let me touch real quickly before I, before I finish up. It develops clear truths about God and man. And this is, this is what finally convinced the scholars meeting to, to assemble the canon of, of Scripture. Convinced them that it belongs in the 66 books we call our Bible. Chapter 3, verse 14, about God's existence. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. In other words, there's this, there's this, the reality that God is. Now, chapter 5, verse 2. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. There's this, this again, the existence of God. The sovereignty of God comes up. Chapter 6, verse 2. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous In other words, God sovereignly distributes and determines who will, who will reap the benefit of that. Chapter 7, verse 13, consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? A different tone, not that not the crooked cannot be made straight. Who, what mere man can make straight what he has made crooked? And the answer is no one. Only God can do that. And so you see this, these, uh, these, God's justice comes into play. In chapter 5, verse 8, if you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. In other words, God, God gets the final word as the ultimate just judge. Chapter 8, verse 12 and 13, though the, a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before God. So God is a just God, is the tone there. Man's sinfulness is identified. Uh, in here we've read some of these verses already. Man's finiteness comes into play. A man's duty, calling him to, that he's a man under duty to his creator. His creator has made him to carry on. Uh, but not just his duty, man's immortality. I can't emphasize chapter 3, verse 11. This is a, this is a pivotal verse at this time when the scripture is being put together. The acknowledgement that God has put eternity in their hearts. It's there. Our challenge our challenge is to, is to feed that with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a divine punishment and rewards in here. Well, time is running away from us. Let me, let me wrap this up. I want to contrast for you. Life under the S-U-N, life under the sun, this is used 29 times in Ecclesiastes, with life under the S-O-N, the son of God. I want you to see how, how the gospel answers some of the concerns of Ecclesiastes. Let's look at this real quickly. Life under the sun, the S-U-N. What advantage is work in life under the sun? Well, Ecclesiastes 1.3 says, What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Well, the answer, life under the S-O-N, Philippians 1.6, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, man living only for himself, it is vanity. Man living to the glory of God by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, is, there will, it will be brought to completion in the day of Jesus. Again, life under the sun, the question, there's nothing, or the statement, there's nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1 9 closes, there's nothing new under the sun. Well, what about life under the S O N? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In other words, all things can be made new in Christ, but only in Christ. 
Again, life under the sun. All deeds are vanity under the sun. Chapter 1, verse 14. I've seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a chasing after the wind, a striving after the wind. What about life in the sun? 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. What a contrast. In Christ, there's, there's no vanity. It's not vain. You live out your days. I told, I told my, our friend in the hospital today when we talked, I said, uh, I wanted to emphasize this after Brother Norman's prayer this morning. I said, but then I said, I know you want to get out. We want you out. But I want you to consider God has you there as a missionary, ministering to people and blessing people. Go after that until he's finished with your ministry there. I will, he said. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And then the fruit of labor is hated under the sun, S-U-N. Chapter 2, verse 18. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. In other words, I'll never, the vain approach is I will never uh, get to enjoy all of this. But in the sun, Colossians 1, 10 so walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That that's the goal. The next one, man is mortal under the sun. Who knows, chapter 6, verse 12, who knows what is, is good for a man while he lives the few days of his vain life. Well, that's a real encouragement. The few days of his vain life, which, he, which passed like a shadow. For who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? Well, John 3.16 answers that. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever is believing in him should not perish but have eternal life. There's, we, we know. We may not know what tomorrow brings, but we know ultimately where we will reside. And then the idea that pleasure is temporary under the sun. We've read you chapter 8, verse 15. I won't read it again, but I want to hear you hear the evangelical response. Philippians 2, 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's not meaningless if you're in Christ. And then a man cannot discover God's work under the sun, Ecclesiastes 8, 17. Man cannot find out the work that is done, he says. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. This is a man who is trying on his own without an eye toward God, not motivated by the glory of God, and this is true, he will not. But what about in the gospel? 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. True ultimate knowledge is coming in the gospel. Well, the Ecclesiastes says all men die under the sun. Chapter 9, verse 3, we've already read that. The gospel answers with 1 John 5, 11, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Death here is not the final journey. We go from here to eternity apart from God or eternity with God. Eternity in hell, eternity in heaven. Life under the sun says strength and speed are essential under the sun. You've got you've to be swift and strong and smart. In the gospel, though, we read this in 1 Corinthians when we studied through chapter 1, verse 27, that God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He mocks the wisdom of this world by operating the gospel the way he does. And then life under the sun will cease. Chapter 12, verse 2 of Ecclesiastes, Before the sun and the light of the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return, after the rain, that we will be gone. But 1 John 5, 13, close with this. I write these things to you who are believing in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you are having eternal life. And so what you have here in Ecclesiastes is, this, is the story of how meaningless life is. When someone says to you, well, life is so meaningless, don't say, no, it's not, no, it's not. Why do you say that? And listen. Because they're telling you something about that eternity thing in their, in their lives. 
listen to them and say, well, you know, it was meaningless for me at one point. I don't want to tell you where I found meaning and hope. I want to tell you where, where that ache that you have for something more was met. Ecclesiastes, understanding it, listening to people speak it when they don't even know they're speaking it, can be a powerful path to sharing Jesus Christ with people who is ultimate meaning, who is ultimate reality, who does give hope, who does give joy, who does give peace in believing. Ecclesiastes belongs in the scriptures and is a great study of the human condition apart from God. Questions or comments that you have before we wrap up tonight?